Good morning, everyone. My name is Kerstin Muff. I have the pleasure of uh, chairing our first session. So we will start with Mr. Kaplong, who is a French engineer, researcher, and entrepreneur living and working in Switzerland. He received his PhD degree in artificial intelligence from the university in Paris, and he is the director of the Digital Humanities Lab in Lausanne. Good morning. Thanks a lot. It's a really a great pleasure to be here with you in, uh, in Marburg. Um, uh, I'm just going to present the, the Venice Time project. It's a 10-year project. We started three, uh, three or four years ago. It would not have been possible with the help of uh, several uh, generous sponsors. Yeah, we got the very uh, nice support from the Fondation Lombardier, which helped us build the initial uh, infrastructure. A couple of years later, we had the Fondation Al Suisse, we were, which uh, granted us with two uh, project to continue the scientific uh, adventure, and then now we are uh, extremely happy to be part of the uh, of the Reed project. I mean, it's an interesting adventure which is which is starting. We'll see that there's many many challenges that are uh, just facing us uh, with um, with this adventure. Uh, the three initial partners were the EPFL, the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale uh, de Lausanne. We had the uh, Cafoscari University uh, in Venice, and uh, we especially got the opportunity to work with the State Archive of Venice. Uh, the State Archive of Venice is a very special place. You know that Venice was probably uh, an exception in medieval time to have a running administration for almost a thousand years, and this is resulting from about 80 kilometers of documents. These documents are documenting every ship that goes in and out of Venice, uh, tax declaration, and many other things, which is essentially the, the treasure we're trying to organize and transform into an information system. So uh, just a couple of examples. So this is how they look. I mean, they range for about a uh, thousand years. Uh, they are uh, organized uh, following the rather big complexity of the Venetian administration. It used to be that uh, there were different uh, places in Venice, and it's only at the beginning of the 19th century that they were uh, group in a, in a single place uh, when the Venice uh, fall and Napoleon arrived and transformed one of the biggest buildings in Venice, the uh, Convenio dei Frari, in uh, this uh, first archive. It's 300 rooms. It's uh, only 10 archivists only which are uh, managing this, uh, these huge spaces. And uh, when you visit these uh, huge corridors, you really feel, I mean, that Although, I mean, so many books have been written about Venice, still uh, one of the biggest challenges is really to make sense and to try to find tools to uh, organize this uh, wealth uh, of documents. So the initial rationale behind the Venice Time Project is kind of easy. It's how can we actually transform this into an information system? Three steps, digitizing. Second step, transcribing, being capable of reading these ancient documents. And third step, connecting people and places that may un be encoded in this document to create a form of networks. The basic use cases is common to many of us here. It's essentially building like a search engine. You may want to type the name of a particular Venetian, Batista Nani, and uh, you may want to just get all the documents in which that person is appearing. This, of course, as any archivist know, it's kind of difficult. In the case of Venice, this is potentially several years of work. So, essentially, the first challenge, I'm just going to, to give you some glimpses. I mean, we've been uh, starting this digitization uh, trials, and now we are uh, combining, on the, on the first hand, I mean, traditional technology, uh, which are adapted to the different uh, type of documents uh, we have in the archive. And once we've been this initial uh, digitization room, no document leaves the archive, obviously. We just duplicate it, duplicating it to try to reach, I mean, the type of volumes which are interesting. I just wanted to mention another technology because it's a bit more science fiction, but it's now proven to pass all the tests we've been uh, doing. It's tomography technology. We are currently making several tests with the Venetian archives to be capable of seeing whether we can digitize books, registers, without opening them using medical imagery. And uh, the principle is, is kind of easy. Yeah. Uh, you see here an example of the type of material we're doing. You, have the, you put the, the register on a rotating uh, system, and then you look through X-ray. 
And uh, this is typical normal photogrammetry. So you see the external of the book. But if you actually do the same type of technology with X-ray, you end up with a form of a 3D volume. Looks a bit uh, like this, like a block of marble here. But if you actually scan through it, you're capable, if you look carefully, of seeing the different pages. So this is the kind of raw material we get uh, out of the scanners. This is the work of Fauzia Alberta and Professor Giorgio Margaritano, which are specialists of, the qu of these questions. And now uh, they're reaching the stage where we essentially develop the, uh, the system for extracting the pages themselves. So it's not like real photographs, obviously, but still, I mean, these are uh, potentially enough for actually running different uh, text recognition and handwritten recognition system on top of them. So potentially, there's a, an interesting potential for these ideas. It's not yet a product. It's still under development. It's been around uh, two or three years we've been working on this. But, I mean, it's scaling all the steps. Most of the challenge now are on the software side, uh, essentially. So let me go now to the second uh, aspect. Oh, yeah, just to show you I mean, how it may look in the future. Obviously, now we're rotating the register. What is extremely interesting is that, like for human patient, you can have, of course, the imaging system, which is rotating around the registers, and that will make the whole pipeline much more fluid, if I may. Second step, uh, which is uh, at the core of the, of the read project, are the technology for uh, being capable of transcribing the documents. One of the particularities of the archive is that we have very little number of already transcribed documents, 80 kilometers of administrative record, which were with no available transcription. And so we have to have a particular approach for this. Um, it, like in many projects of that sort, there are some pre-processing uh, techniques, uh, analyzing the structure of the document, running some initial um, technology for uh, dividing the background and the foreground and progressively arriving <coughs> to the notion of segments, uh, segments that may correspond to words or to group of words. Here we take an example which is pretty easy, if I, if I, if I may, but just to explain you the, uh, the concept. And we, these shapes are then compared with one another without knowing exactly what they mean. Um, the technique here is, uh, is one of the first we, we try, which is based on actual deformation of, uh, of letters. Uh, just to give you an example, you'll see, for instance, twice uh, on that particular page the term novice and OBIS. You see it here and you see it there. For the computer to know these are the same, it's essentially a cost function which is capable of, de of deforming one into another. If that cost function is below a certain threshold, we consider the two things are linked. If it's above, they're not. And then based on that, we are connecting all the nobis on that page, but also on all the nobis on that particular registers and also all the nobis in the archive, if we can. So it's essentially a network which is associated with, with these shapes and which makes that when we get a transcription, which is something extremely precious, uh, obviously, it's not one transcription that you do, but it's potentially hundreds of thousands. So this particular approach, I mean, this word spotting based on distances between shape has been essentially our line of thinking for the last two years. This was an early method based on deformation. Uh, this last year, we actually uh, realized that the recent deep learning technology were giving extremely interested results uh, based on this. And I'm not will not develop that because I don't have the time now, but essentially, potentially, for that type of, of uh, approach, when it's about understanding distances between shape, one of the most promising uh, venue for this. So supposing now you have these distances, we build a tool uh, so that archivist can transcribe the actual the document, and uh, it's kind of straightforward. There's an automatic segmentation. You can regroup a segment. Here you have, for instance, Soto Portego de la Stadiera. You can just write the transcription of that particular word. But you can also, and this is the interesting moment, associate that with an entity, something which you may already have encountered in, um, in the archive, which would be an ID for that particular places. And this is that moment where you make the connection between the transcription and the identification of that particular places. This is actually uh, this system is actually in use by not only by the archivists themselves at the Venice uh, State Archive, but also by all the students of the, the of the uh, archivist school and also all the students which are taking uh, these courses at EPFL. So this is about already several hundreds of students which are uh, progressively uh, transcribing and notating these documents, and this is an interesting pipeline of new um, annotations which is streaming the system. 
And based on that, that permits to associate to each document not a full transcription. This is not at all our, our philosophy, but a kind of network. So this is a tax declaration uh, where we find back Batista Nani. Um, all Venetian needs to field tax declaration, and we found him at a given place. He declared where he's living with different person he's living with. So it's a kind of snapshot of his life. Several uh, decades later, he, again, he has to declare his good. He actually been moving place, is with other persons. Now, this is another snapshot of his life, a small network you see um, on the left. Um, Batista Nani is a noble person, so we're kind of lucky. We found the Libro d'Oro, the Golden Books, all its genealogy. And this will give us, uh, in a rather short amount of time, a whole uh, information about the genealogy. And he happens to be the ambassador of Venice in Paris. So we actually uh, capable of, of also, from each of the letters he's sending every month, getting an idea of its network. So this is the network of Battista Nani. And, of course, all the nodes of that network are also being of other network. And this is progressively shaping something we can maybe uh, uh, called the Facebook of the past, uh, some form of, of big networks where society, as we cross um, new uh, document series, is uh, described uh, and documented through links that are uh, actually in uh, documents. So uh, this is, uh, we build a tool, a web tool, as usual, to visualize that in real time. The more information is streamed in the system and actually documented. You can see now in your browser and see uh, the Venetian population coming back to life, if I may. Uh, all the points are clickable. Uh, you see they're still very not connected for the moment because we are initiating initial document series. But the more we go in the project, the more actually a complex social structure will, uh, will appear. The interesting thing is that you can see that in real time. You can see progressively, I mean, the Venetian society shaping in. You select a given period, and uh, you see how the reconstruction is going. All, of course, these uh, thousands of people are not in history books. They've never been considered, uh, but we have a lot of information about them, and this is the beauty that this is like a continuous stream, which is making these people in some way back to life. One thing which is really missing in that idea of society is space, and that's why a big important part of the project is actually dealing with reconstructing the urban structure of Venice and linking this network with that urban structure. So what do we have? We have cadastres. This is Venice of today. We have uh, geographical information systems. We have autophotography. This is uh, Venice as it is documented today. And the idea is to project this information in the past, making some uh, different jumps. I mean, one uh, obvious, interesting, and easy jump we can do is with cadastres. When Napoleon arrived in Venice, and one of the effects was not only to create, uh, as a result, the state archive, it was also to import a uh, a technology which was uh, flourishing elsewhere in Europe, but not uh, in, uh, in Venice, the cadaster. And so the Napoleonic cadaster, but also in between the Austrian and Italian cadaster, uh, is an extremely important uh, initial step for us, which promised to make a 200-year jump. And uh, essentially, there are techniques, as you may know, for uh, aligning uh, cadasters with real uh, contemporary information based on fixed points. So we are using these techniques on the geometrical, uh, I would say, alignment. And that permits progressively to reconstruct the structure of Venice 200 years ago. This is 1808. Uh, we built uh, a tools, again, a web tool. This is the general philosophy of the project, so that based on initial uh, element, this can be corrected by the researchers, transformed, annotated. Uh, some errors can be uh, corrected uh, manually. And we had this uh, 2D uh, map, but thought as a, uh, I would say, temporal map, which is progressively shaping it. So uh, the interesting thing, of course, with the cadastre is that you have reference point, and we find back our reference point I was mentioning before. This is the, the Rialto Bridge, and you see all these different uh, numbers. And these are, of course, in, uh, described as an uh, entity in the Somarioni. The Somarioni are these well, kind of database, if you may, of 200 years ago, which is describing who was renting the place, uh, what was the activity. And this, again, gives us uh, about 100,000 um, entities uh, describing exactly the state of Venice 200 years ago, who was in terms of real estate and, and of activities. Uh, just to show you, I mean, of course, that there are many, many information. And the interesting thing is that this moment... Which, in which geographical information and uh, societal information is aligned, permits to, 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 as a, to be an initial step for bridging, again, later, now in the 18th century, the Catastici 
are particular way for the Venetian to control the tax declaration. They go and knock at every door and they just mark who is living in, in each house. For instance, although they do not have the numbers of the, of the Napoleonic cadastres, we can make the link through the families, finding back some names which were owned by the son or the grandson of a particular person we have uh, in the, at the beginning of the, of the Ottocento. And uh, through this means, actually being capable of aligning, that's always the key for that type of work, uh, the different information which were using other type of information system like this one from the 18th century. And then we can jump even further. This is the very famous De Barbary map from the beginning of the 16th century and this is giving us um, uh, an extremely interesting information for all the urban but also architectural elements that combine with other forms of indirect sources, transformation, reporting in the city, in the state archive, uh, paintings in some cases when we can trust them, uh, permits to build now not only in 2D but in 3D some elements of uh, the city. Uh, this is uh, the neighborhood of the Rialto, always the, uh, always the Rialto, but now uh, 500 years ago and this is used not as a, as a fancy video but as a placeholder for all the information I've been mentioning. Uh, in the same way, we could actually tell uh, who was renting each house uh, um, 250 years ago. We tried to project this now 500 years ago based on the tax declaration of the indirect information we have so that essentially you can navigate really now in four dimension. Uh, this is, for instance, the Fondaco de Tedeschi, a very important place in Venice where all the German, but not only German merchants from the north were staying when they were in Venice, and we know, for instance, who was renting each room in that particular uh, places. And you see that uh, this is that type of neighborhood with, and, and neighboring, which is even more interesting maybe than what is captured by the administrative states, and which is permit, permitting to understand exactly what was the social context and what, how the information transmission occur at that moment. This is also a search engine, if you may. I mean, you may go in a given point of this 4D space and ask for documents related to these elements. And if they have been documented in the database, then you can search the past uh, this way. That was more or less where we were one, one year ago. And this year, we worked now temporarily to have that same method, but now extending over uh, a period about uh, 800 years. And this is still the Rialto neighborhood. And you see it's progressive reconstruction. All the things we see, all the events you see now are based on document, either primary sources or secondary sources, reconstruction based by other scholars. It's like any event you see on that video is like a citation. And uh, progressively, I mean, you see... Uh, vividly the island of Rialto taking shape with the initial uh, church that was built with uh, the, the third one that, that was there progressively. The first bridge was only appearing uh, as, a, as a bridge of um, uh, boats uh, initially. And then the first Fondaco de Tedeschi, but different from the one I just showed you because it has three courts and not the central court, which then would be kind of prototype for uh, many of the... Um, uh, of, of that of uh, um, bursary systems uh, in, um, in Europe. Um, you saw that they actually filled some canals uh, at, uh, at between the 12th and, uh, and the 13th century and progressively um, there's this urban acceleration which is cumul cumulating uh, essentially at the end of the 14th century and uh, with uh, the whole neighborhood being built but that acceleration also comes with a disaster that is uh, associated with it. The first uh, fire burned the Fondaco de Tedeschi, and then the second fire burned almost everything. And then they rebuilt quite rapidly, actually, the whole shape of the, of the neighborhood. And then we see a progressive uh, stabilization after the construction of the bridge, as you know it, uh, now from Venice. The whole neighborhood is, is stable. So all this reconstruction, which is also a placeholder for the other type of information I've shown, is done with a pipeline which is uh, a pipeline which is automatic in a sense that we are capable of changing information because obviously this is only a momentary reconstruction. At any moment we may have an information in the archive saying that one building was two floors or three floors high, that there was actually a misconception about a given date, and then we can rerun the thing and reproduce the video. It's like a publication, if we may, showing what is a current potentially acceptable reconstruction, but also challenge that can be challenged by any of the Venetian scholars based on document and based on a structured debate. 
One of the most difficult things for building these elements is not only to link, but it's actually to come up with the 3D models. All the 3D models you saw uh, on that video were done by hand. And so we've been thinking how to scale at the Venetian scale, uh, element. And so we've been making an experiment now with a new system uh, based on some spherical camera that you see here. This is an open hardware uh, camera, which is capable of uh, it contains 28 smaller cameras. It is calibrated to do uh, extremely good uh, precision. And we tested that uh, on the EPFL compass. And just, just to, that, to get an idea, the EPFL compass is kind of wide. It just took essentially two hours to scan all the pedestrian and exterior uh, of the compass to trips of 45 minutes. The battery uh, is the only element which is um, problem. This is producing several terabytes that are then analyzed on the, the EPFL clusters. The interesting thing is that it doesn't only provide you a kind of street view of the compass, but it's also actually uh, sufficiently well calibrated to permit to recreate cloud points, so four a uh, three-dimensional view, that means that you have the street view, but you can actually click and know about the distances. And this is extremely interesting because this is potentially replacing what was laser scan techniques and gives a very uh, all-in-one approach to uh, scanning cities very rapidly. So we made the calculus on how to scale that technology for uh, scanning all Venice. And it's big, but it's not huge. I mean, it's essentially, if you take just, of course, you don't have any cars, so you need to put that on the, on the backpack. Uh, but uh, there's two 200 kilometers of uh, Calle, of streets, uh, that you need to go three times. And so this results in 44 terabytes of, of data. And now in collaboration with um, a company called Foxel in, in Geneva, we are planning this initial digitization for this winter. And so obviously, if you just do the Calais, you have something which is missing. You need to do the canals uh, in Venice, so you need to put the same system on a boat. And uh, this is an additional 92 kilometers um, which uh, result in 20 terabytes, uh, which then would provide a data set, which after some analysis would give us the full ever done 3D version of Venice, which would be our starting point to then scale down and try to be capable of adding the right measurement for making the type of reconstruction, of procedural reconstruction that you show that you saw in the other video. So I'm almost done. Just to tell you that uh, we are experimenting also at, at TPFL on how to present that research. Uh, we've been constructing a new building that you see here, this very uh, elongated building, which the first part will be dedicated to a big data project. And the Venice Time Machine in Lausanne is considered a big data project. And so we've been actually uh, investigating about different ways of having people understanding how urban reconstruction is possible, how we can link information extracted from the archive to the actual reconstruction of the past. Also potentially in an immersive way following the time machine metaphor, we still uh, are deciding I mean, exactly what would be the, the, the best uh, system to do it and collaborating with different um, museographic agencies to, to come up with a system. Um, obviously the Venice time machine is something which is uh, uh, taking a lot by the fact that Venice is... Uh, rather well-known uh, symbolic city, but the whole ambition, and that's why we're so happy to be part of the, also the Reed Consortium, is to go beyond uh, that case study. And so one of the things we're extremely dedicated to is making the technology open. All the different uh, websites uh, you saw are actually based on, on open technology. We try as much as possible to do uh, the same thing for hardware, and we try to convince uh, the different partners that they should also do it uh, in terms of open data. Uh, this is, of course, uh, something we should do step by step by uh, showing the potential of and the richness of information which are in the archive, showing that actually it's a way not of, uh, of uh, not making the people coming uh, to the archive, but on the contrary, to show the richness of their content and encouraging uh, people to care and uh, institutions uh, to care and governments to care. And uh, it's nice that it is at the European level that we can do this. Of course, I have a dream, which I, I think is probably shared by, by several of us, is that in, uh, not, I don't know, maybe... In, 10 years, 20 years from now, we would be capable of making this global time machine which would add this dimension which is really, really absent from the internet, which is um, the past. Thanks a lot.
Thank you.